Hi everyone. So this is my first video um, for the vlogs I'm going to do uh, throughout this pregnancy. This is my fourth pregnancy. Um, my name is Tara and uh, I chose to do this video for a couple reasons. So there, I feel, is a lot of stigma against plus-size moms, um, uh, you know, in reference to what doctors and medical professionals will uh, classify as, like, normal. And so I feel that, you know, there I haven't found a lot of um, videos or information for plus-size moms from like other, you know, personal experiences and stuff. Um, it's all just medical statistics that I'm finding from like medical professionals. And so I wanted to do this just so that there were, you know, in, there was information that you have options. And I mean, this isn't for everyone. And there are going to be certain things that, you know, would, you know, really, um, you know, put you as like an actual high risk. So first, I just want to state that I am not a medical professional. I do not have any sort of medical training or degrees or education so this is just my experience, my opinions, and my personal research that I have done to educate myself so that I could make my informed consent decisions uh, for me and my, my pregnancy. Um, I'm 35 years old, which is considered the beginning of advanced maternal age. I don't know if I really look that old. I know I don't look the greatest right now because, you know, I've just been tired and, you know, pregnancy can just, I've got three other kids. So, <laughs> um, you kind of just don't sweat the small stuff when you're pregnant. And so, you know, I just kind of threw my hair up and, you know, here I am, no bra or anything like that. So, um, I feel like, you know, me sharing my experience and my journey may be helpful to other women that feel that they were in the same scenario or situation as me. <clears throat> so, um, I, I am a, a bigger woman, you know, I have a, a body mass index of about 46. And so they would consider that putting me as high risk for things. Um, and that my age would also put me at higher risk for things. So I'm just gonna start with a little bit of my previous pregnancy history and how I was able to come to the decision that I have of doing an unassisted, a planned unassisted home birth. Uh, I'm thinking about a water birth. I'm not sure if I'm going to do that or not. So I'm not going to commit myself to that. I'm probably just going to kind of go by how I feel at the time. Um, so my first pregnancy, I was 19 when I got pregnant and 20 when I had him and uh, one of my early pregnancy blood screenings came back with a high HCG level so I don't know how high it really was compared to like normal range because I didn't really think to ask those kinds of questions but they were looking for um, they were looking for twins and after I'd had several ultrasounds with them looking for twins, they weren't finding twins. 
And so the next thing that they were looking for was Down syndrome or spina bifida or other genetic, um, genetic or chromosomal disorders, which uh, they never found any of those during my pregnancy with any um, testing. So I didn't have any um, amniocentesis testing or anything done because I feel those are too invasive and I didn't feel that the risks outweighed the benefits because they weren't finding anything on the ultrasounds that like val validated or verified me to give consent for something as invasive as an amniocentesis or a CVS procedure. So um, I went full term with my first pregnancy. He was five days before his due date. Oh, hang on. Sorry, my youngest son. Um, so he was full term at five days before his due date. So that's considered a 40 week full term pregnancy. There were no complications during my pregnancy. Um, and the only complication I had during my labor was a allergic reaction I had to the spinal they gave me, which is similar to an epidural, but you're able to get up and walk around. Whereas the epidural, you can't, you have to stay in bed. So I got the spinal and had a really bad reaction. I was vomiting for hours probably like four or five hours of like vomiting and then to dry heaving. And then I had hives all over my body. I was super itchy and I swelled up really bad. Um, the baby's heart rate, my first son, his heart rate was um, dropping and then coming back up. So it was like uh, erratic. And uh, they were getting ready to take me for a C-section. Um, they had given me three reversal drugs and they didn't seem to be working. And then kind of at the last minute they kicked in and his heart rate stabilized <clears throat> and I was able to do a vaginal delivery like I had wanted. And, um, so he came out and he was fine. And the only other thing that was kind of odd was that he had not only a very short umbilical cord that was probably slightly over a foot long, it was like maybe 14 inches or so, was, it was just enough for him to be able to come out, um, was that it was really, really thick. It was probably like a four inch diameter, which was like insanely thick. Um, but there were never any kind of complications or anything that came from it. And he was um, a good, healthy birth weight. He was 7 pounds, 10 ounces. Um, and so, you know, we just didn't really look into anything, you know, after that. So my second pregnancy, I was like 23, 24. And we found out earlier on with the ultrasound that... I had um, what they call a partial placenta abruption. Um, I wasn't having any um, symptoms or signs from it. And it was just a small piece of the placenta that was not attached to the uterine wall. And you can have a partial and you can have a full placental abruption. Um, they, you know, there's several things that can happen from it, um, all the way from like hemorrhaging and like miscarriage and, um, there can be growth development with the baby from not getting enough oxygen and blood supply. Um, <clears throat> so there's lots of complications that can happen from that. Uh, but my doctor at the time did not make me aware of the risks that, I had <clears throat> as possibilities because I wasn't showing any kind of um, concerns or risks. You know, I had the placental abruption, but there wasn't anything wrong with me or the baby. So I wasn't having any bleeding or spotting or, you know, um, there was no growth delays or 
you know, development issues with the baby he was growing normally. And, um, you know, I already had a toddler that I needed to look after. So, um, I wasn't put on bed rest or anything because there really wasn't any need for it. And he was, again, a full-term baby. He was born two days before his due date. Um, that one was all natural with no pain meds, pain relief, um, because of the reaction I had for the first one, I opted to not have anything. And he also came really fast. So even if I had wanted something, there probably wouldn't have been time for them to give me anything because he came so quickly. So that was like really the only thing I found in my research, um, that, was probably due to the placental abruption was the really fast delivery with really rapid contractions that came on very quickly and I progressed very quickly so my doctor didn't make it to the hospital in time and he was born before he arrived to the hospital um, the nurses there had delivered him fortunately my mom was there who's a medical assistant um, because the nurse didn't know, uh, apparently, and, uh, when he was born, the placenta hadn't detached yet, and she was pulling on the cord to try to get the placenta to come out, which was extremely painful, and my mom kind of freaked out on her. Uh, I was on the verge of like kicking her because it hurt so bad. And I was like begging her to stop doing whatever she was doing. Uh, she could have, um, she could have made me hemorrhage, which <clears throat> with placental abruption, that's already a risk is hemorrhaging. So she just increased that risk, which fortunately I didn't hemorrhage. Um, but that was something that was, you know, not, not taught, I guess, with the nurses, but they're required to, I guess, deliver two babies every year unassisted so that when something like that happens with me, they have, you know, some experience and are able to hopefully safely deliver babies before the doctor gets there. That way, if there isn't another doctor on call available to, you know, come in and step in or they're just not able to make it there in time, the nurses are able to do like the immediate um, care until, you know, a doctor can get there. Um, so he was um, a normal birth weight. He was seven pounds, five ounces. And... Um, I, I get a, I get a little notepad here where I wrote things down. Uh, I just didn't want to forget to mention things because there's a lot to remember. <laughs> um, so yep, yeah, he came out and the doctor came and everything was, normal. oh, so I had, um, with my second son, I did test positive for group B beta strep, which you'll also hear referred to as GBS. <clears throat> and it's a bacteria that is, you know, com it's normal, like it's harmful to the moms, but it can be, can be dangerous to the babies, but I'll get into that a little more in a second. Um, so they'll normally do the group B beta strep at like 35 to 38 weeks. They'll do a test. And if you test positive, they usually like to give you a um, antibiotic, um, IV antibiotic, uh, at least four hours or more before delivery. If it's given to you less than four hours, it's not effective. And you can still take the risk. It still gives the risk of passing infection to your baby when you do a vaginal birth. <clears throat> so with my second son where he came so fast there, I wasn't, I didn't receive it in time. I got it like an hour before he came out. So he was put on IV antibiotics as soon as he was born. But again, I was really young then and I just kind of 
went with what doctors and medical staff said were like protocol, like normal, you know, treatment. Excuse me. So, um, the risk of infection, if you don't get the antibiotic and you do test positive that you have an excessive growth of the bacteria is like one to two percent. So <clears throat> one to two babies out of a hundred babies are at risk of getting infection from being passed through the vaginal um, delivery process and, you know, the mom testing positive for GBS. And then 4 to 6% of the 1 to 2% that do get infections, so 4 to 6% of the infected babies, which is a very small amount, um, have, like, um, really bad outcomes, you know, up to um, death. So, um, I just wanted to kind of put those statistics out there. My third child, I was about 25, 25, 26. And, um, again, he was a full-term baby. He was born on his due date. I didn't have any pain meds for him, and it was a fairly quick labor and delivery. Uh, it was like the most um, abnormal kind of labor. Like, you never would have known that I was in labor. I didn't have any pain during this labor, and um, <clears throat> it was almost like, like it was... Like I was dreaming it because when you think of labor, you think like pain with the contractions. And I didn't experience that with my third child. Um, he was a really healthy weight. He was nine pounds, eight ounces. So he was a pretty good sized baby. And, um, you know, I was, you, we were a little concerned about him possibly getting, stuck because he was such a large baby, um, that I was given, um, a type of labor induction. It's not Pitocin and it's something it's actually used for like ripening and softening the cervix to help you. It, they usually use it to help speed already active labor along like if you're already in labor it's just not progressing very quickly they'll sometimes use this if the the cervix just isn't dilating and softening and and thinning out um they'll use this so sometimes it will also induce labor which it did work for me um but after having my third son at nine pounds eight ounces I now know that there is no problem with me um, passing a large, larger baby through my birth canal. Um, that is a concern for some moms. Um, so keep that in mind. Like if you've not had large babies before, that might be a concern for you. If you're care, if your primary, um, you know, OB or your nurse practitioner or you know whoever you're seeing for prenatal, your midwife or you know, whoever is giving your prenatal care um, is measuring that the baby is measuring large. That may be something you want to consider um, with, you know, doing home birth versus, versus a hospital. <coughs> so, again, I just want to make sure that people know that um, I... Uh, I understand that home birth is not for everyone, but I feel like uh, larger moms are kind of put at a stigma that it's not really an option for you. And I want you to know that it, it can be an option, not for everybody. And there's going to be reasons why it's not safe for you or your baby to do a home birth. 
but there's just so much stigma that you don't really hear about it or you know maybe there's just plus size moms that aren't sharing their stories on home births um but I just feel like uh there needs to be more spoken on it and you know you you have to make the decisions that are right for you and your baby so just because this is an option for me doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be for somebody else um so I have never had any miscarriages and I've never had any abortions through my um entire you know pregnancy history I've never had any um common complications like gestational diabetes I've never had hypertension I've never had preeclampsia I've never had um hemorrhaging I've never had high blood pressure or anything like I've always been like really healthy <clears throat> so that was something else that I have uh taken into um account for my decision was that you know I've never had any of those risk factors before and where this is my fourth child even though I'm 10 years older than when I had my last child um, I don't think that I'm at higher, high enough risk where those are a concern for me. Um, I did have I, the Rogam shot after my second and third child. Um, I think. We're not sure what my husband is. I thought that he was O negative um, for blood type, but we're not sure. So I did get an at-home blood typing kit test so that I can um, check his blood type because I do have to know. Um, I have to know if I need to go get that Rogam shot this time because I'm not going to be in a hospital setting as planned right now. I mean, things can change. There could be something that comes up late. I'm just starting my second trimester, so there could be something that comes up between now and the labor <clears throat> that would determine that I'm not able to do a home birth. <coughs> so you'll have to follow along and see how that goes. I've debated about whether or not I'm going to do a live stream with the birth. Um, if I do a home birth, some hospitals won't let you do that. Most of them probably won't, especially with like the lawsuits and stuff going on and like COVID and there's just been a lot of factors where they're probably like, nope, we're not doing videos. So, um, if I do a home birth, I haven't decided whether or not I'm going to do a live video. Um, but I definitely will continue to do, um, updates throughout the pregnancy and, you know, we'll kind of see where we end up from here. Um, so I have gone in for some prenatal care. I have had some, I've had a couple ultrasounds early in the pregnancy, that I was like five to seven weeks when I had a couple done. I have had some blood tests done. I did have the genetic screening done and um, those all came back low risk. So um, all of my, you know, I've been with my husband for 15 years and, um, you know, I'm like a thousand percent sure that my husband and I have both been faithful to each other. And so, um, you know, I did do all of the, you know, STD testing, even though <clears throat> I knew all the answers to those testings. Um, I just agreed because it kind of puts their minds at ease knowing that information, I guess, 
Not that it would really matter because this isn't about them. It's about me. But um, knowing that those ne those tests all came back negative just kind of sets the prenatal care providers a little more at ease about my decision that I'm doing a planned unassisted home birth. Um, they did do an early gl glucose screening uh, because of my weight. And um, normally that's not something that's done until you're into your third trimester. And because of my weight, that was something that was brought up. Another thing was that they, you know, it wasn't just about being an assisted birth. I mean, they'd really prefer me to have a midwife or somebody for the birth. But, um, you know, ultimately they, you know, they're going to want you to go and have the baby like at a midwife center, which are typically like right down the hall from a labor and delivery um, you're, they're on like the same floor that way that like, you're not far from emergency care. Um, so, you know, obviously in, in their eyes, that is what's going to be ideal. And, you know, they're going to try to, most of them are going to try to, um, you know, convince you that that's the best option for the best outcome, but you need to just do your own research and, you know, decide what's best for you. Because really, in the end, it is it is your choice. So, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> another reason that they um, placed me as a, like, potential high risk is, so I have um, asthma and COPD. And I'm not taking my medication for the COPD, which is Spiriva. Because it's not known, it's not that they're saying it's not, they really don't know there haven't been enough studies done for them to say this is a safe medication for pregnant and nursing moms. <clears throat> so, I, according to the manufacturers, they don't recommend taking it during pregnancy or nursing unless it's determined that the benefits outweigh the risks of it and I didn't feel that that fit for me and so I feel that it's riskier for me to continue the medication than it is to not so I do get short of breath and sometimes I do go through like a coughing fit um, I do still use my albuterol inhaler that has been proven safe for pregnant moms. So I do use my albuterol inhaler, but I try not to use it too frequently because when you use it frequently, it becomes um, basically not as um, effective. <clears throat> and so I want that to work when I really, really need it to work. So you may see me kind of start getting out of breath or coughing a little bit. I'm not sick. I have a medical condition. <clears throat> so um, that covers that part. And then um, let me see here. During my um, first delivery, I did tear a little tiny bit. It wasn't enough to need any sutures and it didn't cause any uh, hemorrhaging or excessive bleeding. Um, with my second and third sons, I didn't tear and I was totally fine. But um, that's <clears throat> also something you want to take into consideration is, you know, if you do happen to tear, that is a potential for excessive blood loss. <coughs> um, with my first three pregnancies, I did experience hypermesis. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, 
gravidarium, which basically I'm sure, you know, moms have heard of it in another form. That is the medical term for it. So I had excessive morning sickness. Now, typically they'll tell you the morning sickness goes away around, you know, the end of your first trimester, beginning of your second trimester. And that was not the case for me. I was sick all the way from the very beginning before I would even show positive on a pregnancy test at home all the way up until I went to labor. <clears throat> and it wasn't just like, you know, once a day or a little nausea. I was sick. So my second, third pregnancy, I was so sick that I lost so much weight in the beginning of the pregnancy, by the time I gained any baby weight, I was only back at my starting weight for the beginning of the pregnancy. So by the, <clears throat> by the time I had reached my, you know, third, end of my third trimester, it didn't even look like I really had gained any weight because I lost about 20 pounds before I gained about 20 pounds back. <clears throat> Um, so, uh, that was, and I, they did, they do have some things to help with the hypermesis. I really hope I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> so, um, a, they do have a pill for nausea, but that wasn't an option that they gave me because I was so sick I couldn't keep anything down that they didn't think I would be able to keep it down long enough for it to be effective. The other option was a suppository and I wasn't about to do that route either. I was like, nope, that's a hard pass for me. That doesn't, you know, it's a personal choice. I chose to just cope and deal with the uh, morning sickness on my own terms. <coughs> so, um, this pregnancy has been very different and um, <coughs> I have had some morning sickness and it is getting a little better and usually I if I do get sick it's only a little tiny bit in the morning and it's not every day but I do tend to get nauseous more frequently um and I've found that liquids stayed down easier and were easier for me to get down when I felt nauseous than solids. So like, cause sometimes they'll say, well, try eating like a piece of toast or some crackers or like, and that just wasn't working for me. And so I did a little bit of research and I found that other moms were saying they found that the Ensure drinks were helpful for them. And they also, you know, they have lots of nutrients in them. So that's just kind of a bonus. So that's what I've been using is the Ensure drinks and they've been um, pretty helpful for me and uh, it seems like the, the morning sickness is a little bit fewer and, and less frequent. So I'm hoping that maybe this one will be different and it will go away for like the second and third trimester but I'm not going to hold my breath because it didn't with any of my other three. <clears throat> so with um, my first three pregnancies, I did not take prenatal vitamins. And um, there's a, a common symptom with pregnancy that I'm sure people have heard mentioned is um, constipation and I did not have that and in fact I had you know the opposite and I call them the the you know probably TMI the pregnancy poops <laughs> so <clears throat> um, 
constipation was not an issue. And this time around, I have had a little bit of issues with that. Uh, if this stuff is TMI, then pregnancy videos probably aren't the ones you want to watch. Like these, this is like an informational kind of video. Like I'm trying to just be open and honest and, and just, you know, that way if there's anything people can relate to, they're like, oh, you know, it's not just me. Um, so this time where I'm drinking the Ensure drinks, I did start out with taking the Flintstone children's vitamins I was taking two of those a day and then I was also taking an additional folic acid um, supplement through the first trimester um, so then I started you know I started drinking the insure drinks and those have lots of vitamins and minerals in them and I was drinking anywhere from like four to six of those in a 24-hour period <clears throat> and so I didn't feel that it was necessary for me to continue to take the vitamins too. And I also noticed that I was starting to get the constipation. And I am assuming uh, that that is attributed to the vitamins. I think the vitamins or minerals or like iron or something, there's something there that I feel is... Um, you know, causing the complication of constipation, which I had not had in the past three pregnancies. <clears throat> um, something else that commonly occurs with uh, constipation are hemorrhoids. Not, you know, this isn't like an enjoyable topic or anything, but it's the truth and this happens. And don't be ashamed to talk to your doctor if you're not sure because I've never had hemorrhoids before this pregnancy. So I really didn't know what hemorrhoids felt like. And it turns out like I do have uh, I do have a hemorrhoid, um, which I am using cream and that's going away. So hemorrhoids aren't going to last forever, especially if you get the cream for them. They'll, they'll go away like in a couple of weeks and you're going to feel so much better. So just talk to your provider for your prenatal care if you think that you may have hemorrhoids. So some of the symptoms I had was, you know, because I was constipated, it was really painful um, to, to go number two for that, for the number two to come out was really painful. Um, and then there was a lot of itching and burning and stinging back in the, you know, number two regional area. <clears throat> um, and then I finally broke down and like did like a self-examination in the shower and I could feel a bulge um, of where it's like broken blood vessels that kind of swell. And so, um, you know, I talked to the prenatal care provider and, and, um, and, and it's, that's what it is. They're hemorrhoids. So I've been using the cream and, and that is helping. So please, if you think that's going on, don't be ashamed. It happens. Talk to your care provider and see what they recommend for you to use. Um, the other thing was, so um, this pregnancy with the blood work that I did have done early on, I also had the high HCG levels with this test. So when my first son was, when I was pregnant with my first son, um, I didn't ask like how high the level was compared to a normal range, but this time I did ask and it was only about a week. So I was like six weeks and five days and I was showing, um, showing levels of like almost eight weeks. So it's like seven weeks, five days. It was like a week difference with the levels. So I didn't really feel that that was a big enough difference because for there to be any kind of concern because even though I can give them an exact date of when my husband and I were intimate for this baby 
um, there's no way for them to determine an exact date of conception unless you're doing like IVF or something like that. You know, if it's a natural conception, <clears throat> you can ovulate for like 24 to 48 hours and the sperm can live inside you for, I believe, up to 72 hours or something like that. Uh, you know, you may want to just double check any of these facts because I'm just kind of off the top of my head what I believe I had read. So, um, <clears throat> date of conception can't be exactly pinpointed with natural conception. And, um, you know, so they say like any time, like if you, um, if you deliver like a, uh, a week before or a week after your delivery due date that's still considered full term and like within the normal range because there's that little bit of a cushion room variant of when concept when conception actually took place so I feel like the the one week is not a big enough difference for there to be any concern with that high hcg level because I didn't really think that that's I, I'm surprised they were considering that high and I almost feel like they're just looking for reasons to, um, to like label me as high risk. So I bet I was turned away from a couple places because I was considered high risk and I'm like, <clears throat> I'm, um, uh, pretty adamant on like my decisions and so maybe they didn't like that I was like standing my ground with the decisions that I'm making and that I'm not basically handing over the reins to them uh, and I feel like you know they wanted to do all these different tests and stuff that I've turned like I'm not doing any more ultrasounds and you know that I'm not doing more blood work or anything like that like I'm just doing, I'm not even going in for prenatal care visits. They're all going to be like virtual. So, um, from here on out, but I did have some testing done and, and I do recommend like, especially early on in the pregnancy, you know, to get a, a lot of that, you know, basic testing, like blood work and checking just different levels and things like I do think it's very important to have prenatal care. But since we're past that and we're into the second trimester, I don't really feel like there's a whole lot that I need to go in and physically be seen for. So most of the stuff I can do here at home and, you know, convey the information virtually. And the only thing, because I'm not really that experienced with it, is measuring the top of the fundus, so measuring the size of the uterus and how much the uterus is growing during the pregnancy which I believe they start at like the top of your pubic bone and then they go to the top of the uterus, but I don't really know what I'm feeling for with that. So I, I'm not, I mean, I'll, if they want me to give it a go, I'll try, but that's not something that I really can say, oh, I know how to do that. I do have, you know, my scale, I have a thermometer, I have a blood pressure cuff, I have a O2 pulse oximeter, so that checks your oxygen level and your pulse. And then the, you know, I have the blood pressure cuff that does the blood pressure and the heart beats per minute. And, you know, obviously the scale and the thermometer and like, so basic vitals like those, I can all, I can do all of those and relay those through the video appointments. Um, and then just address any concerns and, and talk to my prenatal care providers about that and then determine if it is something that I should go in and be physically checked for. So like I did have a pap smear done in early in the pregnancy and that all came back normal. And so I don't feel like I had any test results like urine tests and all that. Everything came back normal. So there's really not a urgent need for me to go in and physically be seen. Um, I don't agree with the mask things with wearing masks and <clears throat> where I have the asthma and the COPD. I did wear a mask for the first appointment um, because I did have to be physically seen for the first appointment. And um, 
they, I had the mask on for like five hours. And just from that five hours from one day, I felt like crap after. So I had a really sore, scratchy, itchy throat. And I had some congestion in my chest with like dry coughing. And it took a little over a week for that to clear up and get better. So um, I feel like wearing the mask, it only has negative effects for me. It's not helping me in any way, shape, or form. Um, I hope this doesn't get like flagged because I've mentioned it, but I'm pretty sure that I've already had COVID in March of 2020. I did not go get tested because I don't want to be part of those statistics. The, you know, I don't believe all these numbers are um, l like legitimate tests and COVID numbers and stuff. I feel like some of them have kind of been fudged or falsified a little bit. And so I didn't want to be part of that. But I had all the symptoms of what they were claiming to look for for COVID. And it was the sickest that I had ever been in my entire life. And the peak of it lasted for probably about 10 days. I did have an extremely high fever. It was like 103, 104 for like four or five days. I lost 10 pounds in a week. I was really sick. I couldn't keep anything down. I had extreme chest congestion. Like I was coughing and coughing like I couldn't even roll over in my bed without going into like an extreme coughing fit. I had no choice but to use my inhaler probably like 10 times a day. Um, it was just horrible. And so the peak was like probably about 10 days maybe. But I was still like sick in my chest and coughing um, for probably a little over a month. And uh, I couldn't eat any food, so I don't know if my taste was affected, but my smell definitely was. And again, like all that went away and I got over and like nobody else in my house got sick except for my second son. And he had like really, really mild, like cold, like symptoms for like 48 hours. He <clears throat> wasn't throwing up, but he did complain that his tummy was a little upset and he was running a low grade fever. I think it was like under 101 and, um, it was like a hundred point something. And then he had a little bit of congestion and it cleared up within like two days. So he was the only one that got sick out of me, my husband, our three children and my mother. So, and my husband slept next to me every night, you know, and he didn't get sick. So I'm pretty sure that I already had it. And so I'm not vaccinated for it. I don't plan to get vaccinated. I did have a couple places that were trying to encourage me to get the vaccine during pregnancy. Again, I don't agree with that. Um, lots of vaccines are determined not to be safe for pregnant women, and I don't think that this one would be any different. Uh, <clears throat> and even if I wasn't pregnant, I still wouldn't get it. I don't feel that I'm a high risk for it um, as far as it being life-threatening or anything. So, um, you know, that was another thing. It's like I just, I'm not, I'm not going to wear a mask and I'm not going to get vaccinated. So moving on from that, you know, those are personal choices. Um, I don't, you know, I'm, you know, I don't try to discourage anybody that wants to get it or wants to wear a mask. That is a personal choice. And if, you know, that's what you want and that makes you feel safer, makes you feel better, then I say do it. Because if that was what made me feel safer, I would do it, but it doesn't. <clears throat> So I feel like there were a lot of places that, you know, I went to and I was turned away or ended up continuing to look for a different prenatal care provider um, because they all want to do all these different tests and stuff. And, and they're looking for a reason for my um, body weight and my age to be a risk factor. 
and they're just not finding anything like that. So there, you know, I don't have any of those. So the, the other thing that I probably, um, the only thing that I probably will go in for if I need it would be the Rogam shot. And I, um, you know, I've already expressed my feelings that it's not going to be like a regular appointment, like just schedule a, a small little time block. I'll put the mask on, come in, then give me the shot and I'll leave like there. I'm not going to sit there to be monitored by, you know, anyone for it, you know, reactions or anything. If I think I'm having a reaction, then I'll come back or go to the emergency or something. But other than that, like, I just want to go in, get it, and get out. Like, I don't want to be sitting in there wearing this mask for any longer than I have to because they they make me feel like crap. <clears throat> so, that is, I think I've gotten to everything. Uh, I'm going to leave, like, the comments open on this video, but, um, like, if I do do the um, live stream or whatever for the delivery, uh, I probably will shut the comments off on that. Um, I have pretty tough skin. So even if there are people out there that want to say mean negative things, like it's like pfft, no sweat off of my shoulders. I just move on. There isn't anything that you can say that's going to hurt my feelings or, you know, is going to get to me and bother me and, and affect my daily life because it's my life, not yours. So um, what you think of my opinions or my feelings or my choices is really irrelevant. And I just want to put this information out there for the people that are interested and do want um, some information from somebody else that may be kind of like them. So um, the next video, I'll pro I have an appointment, a virtual appointment. Oh, um, so for, uh, before I forget, for, um, gestational diabetes, normally when they test for that, you would go in and, um, you would have a blood draw, drink, you have five, and then you get five minutes to drink a glucose drink, which is like a sugar drink. And then as soon as you're done drinking that glucose drink they'll time it and exactly an hour later they will do another blood draw and that is normally how they check for gestational diabetes and that's probably the most accurate way which is why they do that test that way but because I'm not willing to go sit and wear a mask for an hour or like really at all I don't want to uh, the Rogam shot, like, there's no, I can't get that. Like, there's no way for me to get it and have it injected here at home. So, um, that's really the only thing, like, I'd have to go in for. Uh, but I am not going in for the gestational diabetes. I don't think it's going to be an issue for me, but what I am going to be doing is instead I'm going to be using a glucose monitor and test strips uh, and these they're called lancets so it's the it's what diabetics do so they would just do a finger prick and they put the blood on the test strips in the meter and it will give you a reading of your um, glucose blood sugars and so what you do I'll be doing that Four times a day for two weeks once I'm into my th third trimester. And if I have like one or two, you know, occasional high readings, that's going to be expected because of diet. And, you know, it all depends on what you eat on, you know, what your blood sugars are going to be. I really don't. I know that people are going to be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's so full of shit. But I really don't eat um, that unhealthy. I'm actually a pretty healthy eater. I don't really eat a lot of um, sugars. I'm going to have to wrap this up because I got to go to the bathroom. So I got to pee. Um, so they, I don't really eat like processed sugars and stuff. I mean, everybody does. I'm not going to lie. I do eat, you know, a candy or, you know, like a cupcake or something, but not 
frequently. And I'm actually, I really don't like sugary foods that much. Like I have to really be in a mood for it. Um, like my friend makes the most delicious gingerbread cookies for Christmas and she sends them, you know, she'll send one for me and one for each of my kids and one for my husband. And I actually ask her to not put the icing on because it's too sweet for me and I don't like it. And my youngest son is the same way. He doesn't really like sweet, sweet stuff. So I would, I prefer things, you know, I like a little sweetness, but not a lot. And I'm not really a big sugar. Like we don't eat a lot of sugary cereals or like sugary snacks and stuff aside from natural sugars with like fruit. I love fruit. Um, and so that's probably my biggest sugar intake is natural sugars with like bananas and melons and strawberries and blueberries. And yeah, I am getting a lot of sugar from those, but they're natural sugars. So it's easier for the body to process them. And I, um, I'm also getting a lot of other benefits from the, um, from the natural fruit, like antioxidants and vitamins and minerals. So right now my sugar intake probably has been a little bit higher because I looked at the Insure drinks and they do have, I think it was like nine grams of sugar and that's a lot. Um, that's a lot more than what I would normally be consuming. Um, so I did get a little bit concerned about the amount of sugar that I am taking in with the Insure drinks, but they help. And so I'm not really eating a lot of solid foods. I do eat some, but I'm not eating a lot of solid foods. And so I feel like it's not enough that my body is going to like not be able to handle processing the sugars. Um, so my, like my A1Cs, when they, when they did the tests for those with the blood, my A1C was like, great. It was like a really good normal range. So, um, <clears throat> I do, um, I was using uh, ginger ale a little bit for nausea, and when I started drinking the Insure drinks, I gave up the ginger ale because they both have sugar, and I was like, well, if I'm going to have sugar, I better pick one or the other, and so where the Insure drinks seem to be helping with the nausea and the morning sickness more than the ginger ale, I decided to get rid of the ginger ale and use the Insure drinks. If you do have nausea, there are uh, morning sickness. There's lots of different natural remedy options out there. I've tried a bunch. I didn't try the bands. So there's like a band that you can wear on your wrist. Um, I did not try those, but I've heard good things about them that they worked. But what I did try, I tried the lozenges, which are kind of like the lollipops and they didn't, they weren't real effective. I got the gum. I got it at Walgreens. And I got the gum, it's this ginger gum, and it's like the most expensive gum ever. You get 20 pieces and it's like $12, $13. Um, but it did work, but it didn't last long. So I would chew a piece of gum and it would only help for about 10 minutes maybe. And then the nausea would come back. So it did help, but only for a very brief period of time. The insurers seemed to help hold me over longer. And so, um, I don't even eat the gum now. Like I've just kind of stuck with the insure drinks. Uh, I, if you do do insure drinks, don't get the insure plus because those go with like the high protein. That one has the least amount of sugar. The high protein has lots of protein in it and still has the vitamin and the minerals, but the high protein only has like, depending on the flavor you get, I think it's like one to four grams of sugar. And then the original has like nine or 10 grams of sugar, depending on the flavor, but the Insure Plus is like 20 grams of sugar for one eight ounce shake. Don't get that. That is too much sugar, even if you aren't pregnant. I can't believe that they have a drink for like nutritional purposes with that much sugar. It's crazy. That is too much sugar. Um, so yeah, I'm going to wrap this up, but, uh, I'll probably do, you know, depending on how the visit goes, I have like, uh, I think two weeks and I'll be doing a virtual visit. Uh, so today's the 13th. So yeah, I think it's like a little less than two weeks. 
I may do a video after that. I'm not sure. We'll see how it goes. Um, and I do still have like all my uh, home birthing supplies coming. So I didn't order like a kit that was already kind of like bundled. So I went through and built my own kit. So I watched some videos of like other midwives and other people that did their own home birth kits and I just decided like what I wanted from theirs and made my own birth kit um so I'll go over all that stuff hopefully the next video all the stuff will be in by then so I think I have probably about half of it um and I'll go over like where I got those supplies and um why I got them so my birth kit for at home birth is probably a little bit excessive compared to the videos that I watch, but I like to be prepared. Like I would rather have it and not use it than need it and not have it. So um, I have quite a large home birthing kit that I've put together. Um, and, you know, by then I'll be able to kind of like tally up like what it costs for me to put that kit together and you know you can shop around and maybe find other places that may have these items cheaper for you but um I do kind of look forward to that and going over and sharing that information because I feel that you know I have very good reasons for why I have all the items that I picked for the birthing kit um things are probably going to be a little hectic you know, we've got um, Halloween around the corner. So my second son was born on Halloween. So he'll be turning 12. Um, and we've got, so we attend our church and my two older kids uh, volunteer with the church. And so they'll be doing like a trunk or treat thing, handing out candy and, um, you know, with the appointment. And we have a lot of animals too. That's something else that, you know, a, a home birth midwife may not like. Um, so we have a lot of animals. We love animals here. So we have two horses and a donkey, which obviously aren't in the house. Uh, we have eight dogs. Um, there's two ferrets, two, uh, there's two rats, a bunny and a hamster. And then I have three boys. So, <clears throat> um, it's kind of a hectic, chaotic household. Like I'm surprised I've only had one brief little interruption from a kid in this entire video. And like, I haven't heard any screaming or like wrestling matches or anything like that going on or like the dogs going off. I guess I just got really lucky with this first video, but don't be surprised to hear those things in the next few videos. Um, but anyway, I just want to thank you guys for tuning in um, and, and supporting me with join, you know, joining in my channel that I'm starting. You know, if you found this video helpful in any way, please like, share, comment, subscribe, and um, let me know what you think. If there's anything that you want to know or, you know, any questions on if I am or I'm not going to do something or my, you know, opinion about it or whatever, you know, please just uh, let me know and I will do the best I can to get back to you in a timely manner. Um, but anyway, I hope y'all enjoyed this video and I hope that it was helpful and, um, we'll see you next time.